Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Imagining Collective Futures in the Amazon. My name is Marcia Castro. I'm the Endelot Professor of Demography and Chair of the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And I also chair the Brazil Studies Program here at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. I'll be your moderator today. So today's event will be held in English and Portuguese with simultaneous translation to both languages. Please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen to assess either of the channels. Para o nosso público no Brasil, cliquem no botão de interpretação na parte inferior da sua tela para acessar o canal de tradução simultânea para o português. The Amazon is Brazil's greatest natural resource. Historically, the development model for the Amazon has been focused on the exploitation of natural resources, resulting in environmental degradation, particularly deforestation, land-related conflicts, increase of infectious diseases such as malaria and arboviruses, just to name a few, and murders of environmental defenders, disproportionately affecting indigenous and peasant populations. Recently, deforestation in the Amazon has hit the highest annual level in a decade. Between August 2020 and July 2021, the rainforest lost almost 10,500 square kilometers. That's an area about 13 times the size of New York City. This figure is 57% higher than in the previous year and is the worst since 2012. Recent data released by BAP Biomas showed the scars left on the area because of fires and exploitation of the forest resources. A true development model for the Amazon must learn from history and be bold, creative, carefully planned, inclusive, and sustainable, allowing for economic growth while avoiding environmental, social, and health problems. It must benefit the local population. While Brazil played a major role in setting the agenda for sustainable development when it hosted the Biodiversity Convention in 1992, almost 30 years later, the country is under a leadership that favors the opening of protected areas to agriculture and mining and seeks to relax important regulations. This has environmental, but also human rights implications. Considering this scenario, um, what futures are in dispute in the Amazon? How can an interrelated, interdependent, and sustainable collective future for the rainforest and future generations of humans and non-humans emerge? To reflect on those issues and questions, we bring three voices with deep knowledge on the Amazon. First, um, uh, Felipe Milanes, a journalist and professor um, at the Institute of Humanities, Arts and Sciences, the Federal University of Bahia, and visiting scholar at the Clark Center for the Study of Natural Resource Extraction in Society at Clark University. Second, uh, Marcelo Furtado, who has over 30 years of experience working in the sustainability field and is currently a Lehman Visiting Public Policy Fellow at Columbia University. And third, we have Cacica Katia Sileni Valdenilson, the first female leader of the Gavião Akrati Kateje ethnic group and visiting researcher at the Federal University of Bahia. Today's event is being presented in collaboration with Articula Fito, the Clark Center for the Study of uh, Natural Resource Extraction and Society, the Columbia, uh, Columbia Global Center um, in Rio de Janeiro, the Environmental and Natural Resources Program at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, the Harvard University Center for the Environment, the Harvard University Native American Program, and the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. We'll be recording today's webinar and will be available on the Dr. Class YouTube channel in the coming weeks. We'll also email a link of the recording to everyone who registered for this event. We hope to see you at other events that we host at Dr. Class. And in the chat, uh, we've added links to our online calendar as well as social media channels. Please follow us there for the most updated information on upcoming events. We would love to hear from you, your thoughts, your questions during today's event. 
please, um, if you have a question for our speakers, um, send it through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session, but feel free to submit those questions at any time. So um, without further ado, I would like to begin our discussion by welcoming our first speaker, Filippi. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcia, for the introduction. I would like to thank uh, Tiago, all the organizers. I also thank uh, Marcelo and Katia to be here uh, with me today. It will be a great pleasure to exchange some ideas with you. And to thank uh, Denise, Tony Babbitton, my friends, who are hosting me here at Clark. Charlie and uh, other uh, people who made it possible for me to have the chance to spend the semester researching here in the United States. Uh, and I, I do that with a great compromise and expressing my so deep solidarity with indigenous people and environmental defenders in Brazil who are uh, suffering a terrible pressure and threats increasing uh, in a disproportional way since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, the, the political situation got even worse during the pandemic as well, uh, are aware. But uh, with great uh, feeling of uh, solidarity and responsibility that I also express my huge admiration to indigenous women who were marching in Brasilia last week and uh and probably what was the most beautiful and organized movement against the violence uh the political violence from bolsonaro and they were uh, challenging the future i was really impressed about uh, the creativity of this movement and they were ca calling for reforesting mines and uh and today in, the, in this afternoon the supreme court in brazil we'll be discussing exactly the future, not only of indigenous people, but the future of forest and a future also of memories. The time frame, the, the so-called Marco Temporal, is an a racist strategy to erase the violence of the past and to build new and more aggressive, masculine, patriarchal, and uh, military futures. And uh, he, this is a, a violent movement of privatization of public land. It's not only uh, affecting the indigenous people, of course, it is the first uh, target from this uh, case in the Supreme Court, but it affects all of us. And, and, and this is also from where uh, I started some of my, uh, the ideas that I want to share with you. It's that indigenous people, they are not fighting for only themselves. And you're going to have the chance to listen to Katya at the end, uh, expressing how she, she is today fighting for future generations, not only of Gavion, but for all. And I invite you, uh, after our talk, to look at, at the map and find, look for the city of Marabá. You can uh, find very easy where Katya will be speaking from, because her, the, the indigenous land, Mãe Maria, is the only green area that you can see from any map. During the pandemic, uh, during the first uh, months, the first wave of the pandemic, I was, I had the chance to be quarantined in the countryside, and I decided to start planting some trees. I was invited by a dear friend, Ailton Krenak, to do so. And I planted some Angico, uh, Angico Branco, Anindatera Columbrina, which is a very powerful uh, shamanic plant. And also some beautiful Ipes. And they would grow, they would take about 15, 20 years to, to grow. But I, I wasn't in a hurry uh, to, to, to become beautiful trees. And I shared with Ayuto and I felt very well when I was planting those trees, because I, I realized that the struggle and the war that we are living today is a longer, it's, it's, it's a longer war in time. Things will not change very fast. The coronavirus uh, pandemic, the outbreak would not, would take much more than a few weeks or 
months ago, I think, by that time. And planting trees was helping me to, to think on a broader thing. And I, I shared this uh, with my friend Ayutun, and Ayutun, uh, he, just a few days after one of our Shabanchi friends killed from COVID, he sent me a beautiful poem, which is called Another Sky. And he says, he writes, it truly disappeared. It was, it was always hidden in the folds of time, an inescapable like lightning on a dark night. It descends to earth, bringing pain and madness. Hiding in these folds, it sleeps like the word of a spirit who falls, because it never knew the goodness that the sky holds up from high. And the idea of another sky behind another horizon, uh, <clears throat> I thought it really powerful because he was trying to mobilize in our discussion other dreams and not to be stuck in a sense that we have nothing to do, cannot act, but how we could start moving. And, and by the same days, I also decided to plant four ficus, figueiras, because they would not live for 25 or 50 years, but they would live for 500 years. And I thought, well, those trees, they will probably, they're not gonna carry it's not going to be that important in their li lifetime, the years that we're living today, because what's going, how is going to be the world in 400 years from now? And, and, but I didn't know to whom I was planting those trees. I just felt like it, I would be feel good planting them. Uh, I had the chance after uh, these uh, very isolated days to visit three uh, friends in the Amazon. Megaron Chukahamai, the chief Casica, Katia, and the sister of Maria, and the sister of Zé Claudio, who were killed 10 years ago in a, in, the, in a reserve very close to where Katia did. All of them, during the isolation in the, in the, in the pandemic, they decided to plant trees. Uh, Megaron opened a beautiful traditional Kayapo farm. And he was, uh, he with uh, the shaman Bejai were planting uh, manioc, uh, sweet potato, and other, and corn, and, and some of traditional Kayapo pro food production. And he was doing that because uh, he was feeling good to do that, and he was very much worried about the future generation, that they should have access to this uh, important Kayapo uh, food stuff. And, um, and then I went to visit the Claudia and Maria settlement where they were assassinated, and Claudia Lisi, the sister of the Claudia, she had just led uh, also a, a, a movement to plant an agroforest out of a small pasture that was inside that settlement. The settlement has been completely deforested in the past years. But she was planting, she was looking for the future, we need to plant a new forest here. And I was amazing with, uh, with how, how many people are doing, which is not only micropolitics, as Ayuto uh, uh, said, but I think they are doing more like undoing the Anthropocene, undoing what has been placed in the Amazon since the, the 70s. And um, I, I was thinking that uh, one of the heroes of the contemporary president of Brazil is the dictator Medici. And in the 70s, uh, the, the, or the militaries organized what we, we see today, this violent invasion of the Amazon, producing the forestation, masculinization of the ecosystem, and roads everywhere, financialization of nature, in an extreme violent uh, uh, environment. Among one of those projects was the dam to Kurui, who destroyed one of the most beautiful rivers on earth, the, the, the Tocantins, and dispossessed the Gavião, the Akrantika Tejé people. In 1986, when Elio Gators, the governor of Pará, uh, was opening the dam, 
he made a discourse saying that people wanted to protect the forest, arguing that the forest was virgin. And he was saying, we're going to touch and we can rape the forest with, re with reason. And he used these words, making fun as they were jokes. Among the people dispossessed, the payare catches that. The years after, he, he with uh, non-indigenous allies, Yara Ferraz, Carlos Mares, José Benante, they sued the Brazilian state in Eletro Norte. It took 30 years to win that battle. And Katia, the daughter of uh, Payaré, she was leading now this legal case, and she won, and she won back a land. Just two months ago, I thought that that was one of the most beautiful stories of the, uh, out of the pandemic. But the land was the forest destroyed, and I asked Katia, Katia, what are you going to do? What are you going? To, what are you planning to do there? Planting back the forest. Which forests are you going to plant? Castanhais. The Castanhais has been completely deforested. That's where the point of no return of the Amazon, I believe, have started. And to conclude, uh, to undoing this masculine, violent, deforest military Amazon that was building a dictatorship, also undoing the Anthropocene as uh, Stefania Barca says, I believe is what Katia is proposing in Mãe Maria. They are replanting, but they are replanting castanhas, the Brazil nut. They are planting uh, trees that will take 40, 50 years to, to start producing fruits, but they will survive for more 500 years. She is planting for future generations. How can we imagine uh, the, a new word for future generation that will be completely different from the word that we have received from past generation. Thank you so much for the chance to be sharing with you these anxieties, ideas, and narratives. Thanks so much, Filippi. I, I love what you were able to do in just 10 minutes. You, you brought together hope, poetry, history, and your own testimony of uh, what one person, uh, you know, in among a million people can do. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so we're going to move on to our second speaker. Marcelo, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not going to be uh, able to follow Felipe. <laughs> on the poetry, but I hope I can follow his um, invitation for us to imagine uh, Amazonia on a positive way. To do that, I think it's very important for us to uh, recognize as society what we want for the Amazon and what we don't want for the Amazon. Because what we don't want, we must stop. And what we want, we must support and prosper. So if we agree and we understand that for this planet to win the climate challenge, we need the Amazon standing because there will be no planet on 1.5 degree that will reflect the SDGs unless we keep the Amazon forest standing, then we need to recognize that we need to stop the violence in the Amazon. We need to stop deforestation in the Amazon. We need to stop illegality in the Amazon. And we must keep the forest standing. Now, to do that, we need to agree on what we want in the Amazon. So you, Marcia, mentioned in your opening remarks a few of these elements. Um, you mentioned the bioeconomy. You mentioned the culture, you mentioned health, but I think it's important for people to understand that we have uh, this incredible um, issue of culture. We have the people from the Amazon that we need to respect, and that means respecting the traditional uh, people that are there. And we also need to address the fact that we have cities and millions of people now living in the Amazon as well. 
So when we look at the world and the planet, uh, there are four transformations that we're going to need to do. One is an energy transition, moving away from fossil fuels to renewables. And then comes the question, what are the energy choices for the Amazon? If the Amazon is not, if we are not going to reproduce in the Amazon the mistakes we've made in the past, does it make any sense that the Amazon lives on fossil fuels, on diesel, which is the reality today? What, what is the image? How can we imagine a sustainable energy source for the Amazon? And then I think we're talking about a decentralized system with access for all with renewable energy. The second question that comes to mind is we need to change and transform our food system. If we keep moving as society with the kind of food production and food consumption that we have, we are compromising the Amazon. So if we think about a transformation of our protein approach, we're going to have to look into alternative proteins. We're going to have to look into nutrition and nourishment of society. And we're going to have to look at what are the other ways to produce protein, particularly animal protein, which unless we change that reality, we're linking that to eventually a destruction of an ecosystem. The third transformation is on materials. A lot of the materials we use in our everyday life are now fossil fuel based. And for many of the alternatives, we could look into the forest as the source of these alternatives. And that is when uh, the whole idea of prospecting on this bioeconomy comes so important. And how can you do any prospection into bioeconomy without taking in consideration, number one, the knowledge that the, tradi the traditional populations have, and number two, how can you do that in a, in a just way in which you dialogue about access and benefit sharing of that knowledge and of the prosperity that that could bring to society? The third transformation, the fourth transformation, so we spoke about energy, food, materials, is one less spoken about, which is about the transformation of our mindset. Most of the population of the planet lives far away from the Amazon. And many people will never have a chance to go to the Amazon. So we need to bring the Amazon to people's minds and heart. Uh, the Amazon is not only the water pump and the air condition of Brazil. It actually provides the whole ecosystem service to the entire planet. Uh, the reason why we have the marine currents, the reason why we have water, the reason why we have climate control has to do with the fact that we have a standing forest. So. It's extremely important that people recognize that that forest is standing there predominantly because the indigenous peoples kept the largest part of it standing. A combination of protected areas and indigenous lands is what today kept most of the green parts of the map that we see for the Amazon. And if we want to keep that forest standing and hopefully recover degraded land and degraded areas into forests again, as Felipe was just giving a, an example earlier, uh, we need to have society willingness and society support. And for that, we need to have this engagement of society. And that's why I'm mentioning that on the fourth pillar. But I do see a lot of positive things happening. In, in despite all the the, the, the bad news we have on deforestation, on the violence occurring in the region, on the political system we have established in Brazil today, which is a system that is absolutely ignoring the social, the rights, and the environmental aspects 
that we fought so hard in the last 30 years in the country. The fact of the matter is that even in the Marco Temporal uh, that, that Felipe was mentioning, which is this very important piece of legislation that will affect very negatively the, the indigenous communities, we had uh, what I think it's an important issue to underscore. In the Supreme Court hearing, we had an indigenous lawyer defending the, what the indigenous peoples think and believe should happen. That indigenous leader's um, lawyer that, that was there, um, Eloy Terena, he had the support of a lot of other lawyers from other organizations like Connect Us and, and, and many others. But the legitimacy and the protagonism of the indigenous peoples was in the hands of indigenous peoples. And I think that that's a very important um, new image that is becoming stronger and stronger every year. But I think that it's a very important un understanding and acknowledgement that we need to, to, to do here. Um, there are another uh, piece uh, connected to the Marco Temporal, but also to the Amazon vision, which is also how uh, parts of the business community, civil, organized civil society and academia is working together to promote. I myself participate on an initiative called the Brazilian Coalition on Climate, Forest and Agriculture that developed a vision for the Amazon, which is a vision with inclusion, with sustainability, with justice. And mind you that last week, there was an op-ed on the business paper, Valor Econômico, signed by Capo Bianco, who's a founder of the Instituto Socioambiental, that is a traditional, very um, uh, important um, legacy organization that defended indigenous rights. And on the other hand, the CEO of a pulp and paper company writing about the fact, and the name of the article was a Marco Temporal against everyone, saying that this Marco Temporal, this piece of legislation being judged in the Supreme Court is, uh, if it goes to the, to the direction of taking away the rights of indigenous peoples, it, it's not only against indigenous peoples, it's against the entire population of the planet Earth. That is new, that is uh, a, a new trend that you're seeing. Um, also at um, Alana, uh, when I was at the Alana Foundation, we funded two initiatives. One is the X Prize Award, which is a global award looking at merging the technology world with the sustainability world, trying to bring technologies that will help us identify biodiversity in the forest in order to think about creating future materials out of the wealth and richness of the biodiversity of the forest. So it's an award encouraging um, people all over the planet to use their skills and help us solve this puzzle on how can we make the standing forest respond to the needs that we have in this planet without destruction. And finally, I would say something that a lot of people probably don't pay attention, but we need to make these um, causes true. And we did a TV series called Aruanas uh, back in 2019. And a lot of people say, but why, why did you do a TV series to talk about deforestation and the value of the snake? forest and the value of activism and the forest defenders, simply because unless, civil, unless society at large, not only the Brazilian society, the global society, understands three things. Deforestation is wrong and we need to stop it. Killing environmental defenders is wrong, we must stop it. And the standing forest is our future. This will not, you will not have political support from society for all the great work that politicians, some companies and NGOs are doing all over the place. We will not have the society supporting 
the indigenous communities and the indigenous populations that have been keeping that forest standing for thousands of years. So we did this TV series and then we did a research to see if we succeeded in our goal. And although the country is very polarized and very divided, we got 80% approval rate for the series, meaning that 80% of the, the, the population that saw the series, so we're talking about a 40 million people audience, approved the content of the series. I can assure you that among these uh, numbers, we have conservative people, meaning that it doesn't matter if you're from the left or from the right, we, if you put the message in front of people, those three messages, you will get a very clear signal that there is strong support, independent of the political color of where you stand from, that you would support that. The second thing that happened in the research, it's indicated that people took action and people understood and supported the activism happening to support and to keep the forest standing. So all to say that uh, when we hear now from Kasiki Katia, uh, it's important to understand that there are a huge number of people in Brazil, in Latin America, and in the world supporting the idea of supporting traditional communities and indigenous communities, supporting the standing forest, and they see the value and the importance of keeping the forest, the Amazon forest standing, and they will be with us in solidarity. I think it's part of our job to help people convey that, to give them elements on how you can do that, how you, you can support that. And finally, I think it is our job to show that while there are a lot of criminal things and uh, and, and horrible things happening in the Amazon. The Amazon in itself is our future. It's a beautiful future and has a fantastic value for future generations. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Marcelo. And I, I love the way you frame the four transformations that are needed. And I honestly think one thing you said, um, we need together society willingness and support that's going to be needed to get all four transformations going and and i hope we're going to have time because i i would love to have a follow-up question on that but but now um we're going to move on and hear from cacica katia boa tarde a tu vocês estão me ouvindo estamos sim então eu consegui eu queria dar uma boa tarde Agradecer o convite do Felipe, do Tiago, dos demais né, que estão aí presentes. Eu sou a Cacicátia, do povo Acranto KTG, Gavião da Montanha. Nós somos um povo atingido por uma barragem, atingido por uma ferrovia. Somos um povo sobrevivente, né, que sobreviveu. E hoje eu estou aqui para somar com vocês. É, eu tive escutando a cada fala de vocês, cada fala, eu faço da minha fala também de vocês, né? É muito importante quando vocês falam da Amazônia, fala da floresta, vocês estão falando é, do povo indígena, né? Vocês são a nossa família, vocês são nosso parentesco, porque vocês estão é, nos ajudando vocês estão dando as mãos para nós e nos ajudando nessa caminhada. Hoje eu quero somar com vocês, dizer para vocês que hoje nós lutamos para existir vivendo como indígena, lutando pela vida, não só a vida humana, mas a vida da floresta, a vida dos rios, dos animais, do povo indígena e do não indígena, não importa do qual nação seja. Estamos lutando por todos. Nesse momento, nós estamos juntos 
em prol de uma luta só. Eu creio que nós todos estamos, vamos vencer, né? estamos dando passo para que nós possamos ter uma Amazônia é, mais viva, mais curada, né? que hoje a nossa Amazônia está doente, né? está clamando. Assim como nós estamos lutando para conquistar nosso espaço, para nós ter vozes, para nós passar nosso aprendizado de geração para geração. Por isso que todo mundo tem que entender a nossa dinâmica indígena, não só a maneira de nós ser indígena, mas a maneira que nós vivemos. É, a maneira que a gente se comporta, a maneira que nós andamos, né? E que nós fica caracterizado também. Eu falo que nós estamos vivendo um momento de guerra. Nunca essa guerra acabou desde quando eu me entendi. Né? E foi muito cedo, eu sempre digo que eu não tive uma infância né, de uma criança, é uma criança feliz, né? Eu já me entendi no mundo da ditadura, junto com meu pai, vendo o sofrimento, o sofrimento do meu pai, do meu povo, né, do, da minha família. Muito cedo, né, eu tive que entender aquele mundo que nós estávamos vivendo, né, que a gente estava chegando também para somar. Eu vejo assim que o indígena, quando ele nasce muito cedo, ele tem que nascer já com essa, com esse dom, essa visão de cuidar da Amazônia, dos rios, da própria cultura, para manter sua identidade. E a minha não foi diferente, principalmente por eu ser mulher. Muito cedo, meu pai... É, tentou, né, e lutou para me botar na minha cabeça que mulher não era diferente de homem, porque ele estava vendo aquele mundo, né, como a gente foi ouvir muito, né, o um mundo do machismo, um mundo sem respeito, né, que a gente estava crescendo, eu estava crescendo, e meu pai começou a me educar da maneira que ele via que eu tinha que enfrentar. Né? Então, eu vim estudar o português. Eu já tinha 10 anos de idade. Não estudei porque não é o forte do indígena estudar cedo, preocupado com a cultura, para que não perca a sua cultura, a sua identidade. E meu pai, não só ele, como todos os outros indígenas, ele se preocupa primeiro da gente se dedicar à nossa origem, ao nosso povo, à nossa cultura, quando a gente entender, aprender a associar os dois. E foi dessa maneira que meu pai abriu os meus olhos, meu pai me educou, eu agradeço muito, né? hoje, onde ele estiver, agradeço ele, né? eu sei que ele está presente espiritualmente, dando força, me capacitando, né? assim como o nosso papando, que é o nosso Deus criador. E hoje eu levo essa responsabilidade, né? É, junto com o meu povo, que meu pai me deixou, me ensinou esse caminho. Sempre ele dizia, segue o sol. O sol vai ser teu horizonte, né? De cuidar do povo, principalmente não deixar a história do povo nosso morrer. Que tu venha fortalecer juntos com os demais, com o novo futuro que estão vindo cuidar da terra, cuidar dos nossos rios, da nossa nascente, cuidar da vida dos nossos animais. Porque a terra ela está interligada com a cultura, com a biodiversidade né? também da, da, da floresta. É uma interligação com a ciência que a gente tem com a natureza. E por isso devemos respeitar a natureza, respeitar né, a nossa cultura e o que hoje eu estou falando aqui, né? Eu não estou contando mito, 
eu estou falando a verdade, que a gente mantém hoje a nossa floresta viva, os indígenas, com a sabedoria né, que a gente tem dos nossos ancestrais, de proteger, né, nós fomos educados dessa maneira, de mantê-la de pé. Ela não é só útil para a vida indígena, mas para quem vive ao nosso redor desse planeta, desse mundo. Por isso que hoje mesmo né, eu falo que muitos, o Cupen, o não indígena, é, eu agradeço muito que eles já entendem hoje, né, estão somando com nós, é de nós plantar, reflorestar. O que é que precisamos? Que todo mundo venha compreender se cada um tiver um compromisso, uma responsabilidade de estar tá plantando, reflorestando, assim como nós estamos fazendo, plantando castanheira, plantando açaí, é, plantando né, a nossa farmácia verde, como a Copaí, Bandiroba, o Cumaru e outros mais, né, remédio que nós temos uma, uma riqueza tão grande para não deixar acabar fortalecendo, né? e a minha luta é essa, de reflorestar a fazenda que a gente ganhou, que era uma fazenda né? de um fazendeiro, com muita luta com a da Eletronorte, foi um ganho para nós indígenas, porque é um ganho da nossa luta, da nossa perseverança, que nós não desistimos junto com meu pai. Enquanto nós escutamos né? de dizer vocês perderam, a gente continuou lutando, Muitos indígenas do nosso grupo desistiu por não acreditar, dizendo que nós tinha perdido, mas o meu pai disse, enquanto eu existir, eu vou lutar, e se eu não tiver mais, que a minha luta continua. E vocês dão continuidade, né? Agradeço muito a Yara Ferraz, também, que ajudou a escrever a história do meu povo, assim como o doutor Marés, doutor Benart, e outros né, que estiveram junto, né, que escreveram essa história, que vira a luta do meu pai, do meu pai não desistir dos sonhos né, pela terra. É como a voz do meu pai, ele falar todo o tempo que ele amava a terra, que a terra era um pedaço dele, a terra era a mãe dele que criou, e que criou nós todos. E nós, tive, nós tínhamos que cuidar dela, porque ela sempre era muito sagrada e nós tínhamos que respeitar a terra. E até hoje nós temos isso com nós, de nós respeitar a nossa terra, respeitar os nossos rios. E toda pessoa que entra é, nessa terra, entra no nosso território, nós falamos, você entra com respeito. Assim como nós respeitamos o espaço de vocês, que vocês respeitam também o nosso espaço. O nosso espaço é um espaço sagrado, é um espaço de cura, é um espaço de renovação de energia, e nós precisamos estar renovando essa energia. Porque nós já fomos muito é, massacrados. Quando o meu povo foi expulso, quando o meu povo é, foi abusado, eu falo assim, porque na época que expulsaram o meu povo, até abuso teve é, com muita né, indígena. E a gente foi expulso de uma maneira, uma maneira que o Estado não respeitou aquele momento e até hoje eu digo que não respeita. né? Hoje a gente luta, eu falo que a luta não é diferente de antigamente e somos muito criticados, né? porque nós tivemos que se adaptar num novo, habitar nova vida, é, de a, acompanhar o que está acontecendo. Até mesmo nós era impedido de estudar naquela época, né? Nós não podia estudar, principalmente mulher. Mas o meu pai ele quebrou um protocolo né que eu tinha que estudar para me entender o mundo do branco. Entender o que estava acontecendo, o que nós estava sendo é, explorado. né E meu povo foi muito explorado. E quando eu lembro de tudo isso, né eu incentivo é, a minha comunidade, o meu jovem, meus filhos, netos, sobrinho e outros parentes que vêm estudar para tomar conta do que é seu e nós não deixar o que aconteceu lá no passado, porque hoje nós não estamos tá diferente. Essa pandemia, ela veio, né, e ela fragilizou muita gente. A gente sofreu muito durante essa pandemia. Nós tivemos perca de pessoas importantes. Então essa pandemia ela trouxe muita reflexão na nossa vida de fortalecimento de nós cada vez mais 
é, assegurar algo para o futuro, de nós estar se fortalecendo o nosso território, fortalecendo como indígena. É, cada dia mais é nós enfrentando esse governo como de nós resistir, é, segurando nossa floresta, resistindo, é nós plantando, é nós utilizando o que temos nela, é nós comendo, é, comer a nossa comida, que antes nós tinha uma segurança alimentar sadia, nós tínhamos uma riqueza tão grande não sabia. E nós era um povo rico, feliz, nós era um povo unido, nós era um povo é, de sonhos é, para futuros, para geração, e nós não sabia que nós tinha tudo aquilo nas nossas mãos. E nós achávamos que o mundo do branco era que eles viviam mais feliz do que nós. Quando a gente tentou que o capitalismo invadiu as nossas comunidades, né? essas grandes empresas, Vale, Eletronorte, são duas grandes empresas que eu chamo que são empresas assassinas, né? que acabaram com a nossa vida. Empresa que hoje fala que hoje ah, vocês estão bem, né? vocês hoje compram o que vocês querem. Está certo que hoje ninguém vive mais sem dinheiro, mas são empresas que não têm respeito né, pelo povo indígena, principalmente, eu falo até hoje e não tenho medo de falar, empresa que matou o nosso sonho, empresa que não tem um pingo de respeito quando se trata do povo Atlântico KTG da montanha, porque dentro do território Mãe Maria, onde nós vivemos, vive três povos, Toi KTG, Par KTG e o povo Atlântico KTG. Um povo que a Vale não respeita, não considera como povo indígena, a Cranto KTG, onde ela cede é, para dois povos, é, poupança, ela inventou poupança para agradar o índio, né? conquistar o que, para ela dar o que ela queria, é, conquistar, duplicar, desmatar, onde temos supressão, oferece, ofereceu poupança, casa construída, né? e hoje não quer ceder para o outro povo, é, porque hoje ela não é mais uma empresa é, privada. Essa é a fala dela. Aí eu falo hoje, pergunto, onde está aquelas leis que aprovou e hoje não aprova mais? né Está entendendo? Então, são coisas que ficou é, arranhado que ficou aquela ferida é, dentro da gente, né desse, desse respeito. E hoje nós tenta mostrar que queremos se fortalecer trabalhando, plantando, voltar. O que era antes, nós não vamos voltar mais. Mas que, pelo menos, nós dê continuidade de implantar projeto, de mostrar que somos pessoas que temos nossa autonomia, que queremos a nossa liberdade, viver da nossa maneira. Mas, pelo direito nosso, não vamos abrir mão. Nós vamos continuar lutando para que um dia apareça uma lei que obrigue a Vale a reconhecer o povo Acranto e KTG e que ele venha se igualar no mesmo patamar dos dois povos que existem. Então, hoje a Vale ela é uma empresa, a Eletronorte Vale e a Equatorial, tudo junto, onde trouxe a maior divisão de povos, onde enfraqueceu o povo, o povo gavião, e onde também dividiu o povo, enfraqueceu, e, ao mesmo tempo, hoje, se você for analisar, fazer uma análise do povo gavião, em vez de estar tá rico, que o capitalismo entrou, o povo está pobre. Hoje eu falo, nós somos um povo que está pobre, que precisamos plantar, nós precisamos colher, plantar e colher, porque nós temos autonomia, nós temos conhecimento e sabedoria. É isso que eu tento passar o povo gavião, que nós somos capazes, não somos só é, viver só de crítica e de ouvir da própria boca da Vale, das empresas, que o povo gavião é bom de dinheiro. Não. O povo, a empresa não consegue enxergar que hoje nós temos uma vida é, modificada pelo capitalismo, pela evasão, pelo desmatamento, é, pelos nossos garapé hoje, 
os nossos animais, nossos peixes, eles está imigrando para outro, né? Outro lugar e ou então entrar em extinção. Então hoje nós temos que ter tanque para criar peixe, nós temos que plantar, replantar assim como estou fazendo, plantando castanheira, plantando açaí, plantando copaí. Então hoje eu digo essas empresas elas são muito ocupadas, são empresas é, com muita inteligência, a gente sabe que são empresas multinacionais que têm dinheiro, que são capazes de calar qualquer indígena. E a empresa ela foi tão sábia que ela pegou todo mundo no pior momento da nossa vida, onde estava passando por pior... É, como é que eu digo? Por pior dificuldade da nossa vida com a pandemia, com a crise econômica que abalou também. Hoje, nós, povo do avião como indígena, porque a maioria da vida indígena hoje não vive sem o capital, vive sem o dinheiro. Porque a própria empresa, elas deixaram... O... Kátia, a gente perdeu o som. Não vem, não tenho vergonha de... Né, de mostrar do que está acontecendo. Hoje nós estamos divididos é, com a política do branco. Isso é uma política que o branco criou. Isso foi uma estratégia dessas empresas. E eu, onde eu puder falar, vou falar, sim, da maneira que nós vemos. Por isso que quero fortalecer, junto com vocês, que precisamos é, passar para a nova geração que a nova geração ela vinha buscar autonomia com seu próprio território. Nós somos capazes de ter autonomia, assim como hoje eu posso dizer. Eu tenho autonomia porque eu estou plantando, eu estou colhendo o fruto que eu estou plantando e espero que os outros indígenas, através de nós, também venham se espelhar em nós, se fortalecer. Porque eu digo, mesmo com, com, com o fracasso de Tucuruí, com a Vale, que a Vale tenta passar por nós pelo rolo de compressor, mas ainda somos fortes, eu digo ainda somos fortes. Eu falo para o meu povo, nós somos fortes, porque nós sabemos falar, sabemos o que queremos para o nosso futuro, sabemos o que queremos para a nossa geração e deixar esse legado, que ele venha passar de geração para geração e que nós precisamos construir um mundo novo, nós precisamos curar levantar a nossa terra, como todo mundo se conscientizar que tem, cada um tem que plantar, tem que compartilhar conhecimento, tem que passar, dividir, porque desse mundo nós não vamos levar nada. O que nós vamos levar é, é conhecimento. Por isso que nós temos que dividir o nosso conhecimento, a nossa sabedoria com os outros. Porque a nossa, a nossa escola indígena é uma escola que ela compartilha é, o conhecimento e pratica. A gente não tem uma escola é, dos nossos ancestrais é, que ele vai ensinar no caderno, é tudo ouvindo e na prática. E por isso mesmo que hoje nós temos esse conhecimento que herdamos dos nossos parentes, dos nossos avós, né do nosso tio lá atrás, do nosso mano KTG, né? que muitos anos vem passando esse conhecimento pelo respeito um com o outro. Enquanto todo o mundo, eu digo o mundo, ele não se reeducar, é, nós não vamos avançar. Tem que se reeducar, tem que ser trabalhado dentro da escola, tem que ser trabalhado no, no dia a dia. O respeito, o preconceito de dizer que o índio não é capaz, que porque é indígena, ele não pensa. Nós pensamos. Tanto é que se hoje tem a Amazônia, é por causa do povo indígena, é por causa do conhecimento, do respeito que o indígena tem um com o outro. Então, é isso que eu falo. Enquanto o mundo não tiver consciência que tem que respeitar o espaço do outro, não desmatar, não secar igarapés, não atingir o povo indígena, matar a liderança, matar... É, sair matando qualquer um dono de terra, acabar com esse marco temporal, que o governo possa respeitar o povo indígena, tratar ele como cidadão, não ser só lembrado na política, na hora de votar, nós não vamos avançar. E o Obrigada, povo indígena, 
Pois aí é, o povo indígena precisa estar junto, dando a mão um com o outro, para nós avançar. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Cacica, Kátia, é, pela inspiração e mostrar para todo mundo o valor da cultura, da educação e de lutar por aquilo que a gente acredita. Bom, um, I'm going to switch back to English. Uh, we have several questions, so I'm, I'm going to pose a few questions. I'm going to ask all of you to try to be brief so we can cover as many as possible. So the first one... Um, um is from june um ehrlich from dr class and and the question is the amazon is much bigger than than um the amazon biome uh, extends beyond brazil so um have there been efforts to engage uh governments and civil societies particular uh um, indigenous communities in other countries that compose the the amazon like colombia peru ecuador and other amazonian countries so marcelo or Felipe, do you want to take this question Well, I can start. I, I was waiting for Felipe to <laughs> jump in. Uh, so thank you for the question, because that's a very important uh, element. What, what, um, Brazilians tend to talk about the Amazon uh, predominantly from a Brazil lens. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we should talk about the Amazon from a biome perspective. That is uh, predominantly how we see the Amazon when we're talking about the role of the Amazon as an ecosystem for the planet. There has been a lot of articulation historically among uh, indigenous peoples and civil society. Just to give you an idea, uh, in the climate week, in the New York climate week of 2019, uh, indigenous peoples from all over the world rented a theater in New York and had their own program on a whole week of debates, seminars, movies. Felipe will remember how many uh, gatherings we have there. And we, uh, civil societies and so on, were invited to go to their venue to present uh, campaigns and elements uh, that were uh, being organized in solidarity. So the answer is yes, there is a very strong articulation in the the protagonism and the leadership of indigenous communities is an Amazon basin protagonism. It's not only in Brazil that you're seeing that. Uh, having said that, I think it's important to underscore that they're also a very important political landmark, which is the Pacto de Leticia, which is a, a, a government attempt to have uh, elements in common on a policy for the Amazon. It's um, originally led by um, uh, Peru, Colombia, and not from Brazil. But, but the current government of Brazil, the Bolsonaro government, uh, is against that Pacto de Leticia, and therefore Brazil has not moved forward to any kind of implementation. And if you allow me, Marcia, just to underscore, there is a very important uh, research, political pool research done in the Brazilian society about what is the biggest problem of the Amazon? Uh, and that problem is named Presidente Bolsonaro. 74% of the, the, the people interviewed uh, said that Bolsonaro is, uh, the, 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 the correct wording for the, is that the Bolsonaro in the Amazon is uh, either uh, bad or very bad, aims to 71% of the result. Now you're going to say, okay, but I'm sure that the people that voted like that are all uh, against Bolsonaro. Well, it turns out that 35% of the sample voted for Bolsonaro and 32 on the opposition candidate and 21% either didn't vote or uh, made a new vote. So this is just to show you that um, Amazon has a lot of problems, but I think the federal government and the Bolsonaro uh, presidency is identified as the worst problem of the Amazon in Brazil. Thank you, Marcelo. So the next question, um, and maybe Felipe can take this one, is from Charlie Lyons, um, and it's it's 
kind of in the same vein as the previous question, but now it's talking about um, what's the role or, or the responsibility of other nations outside of Brazil uh, in promoting the protection of the Amazon. Um, and uh, in the question Charlie asked it, for example, the US, but so how can this be achieved given the policies of the current Brazilian administration? So, um, Felipe, do you want to take that one? Sure, um, I can make some uh, some comments and some reflections, some critical ideas that I have on that. Is that well, uh, we need to to look at the history of the invention of the Amazon, such as it is the division uh, among the countries that today share the Amazon. They were done during the rubber economy. They were uh, there were political divisions in order to organize the exploitation of the Amazon. Nobody wanted to protect the Amazon when they were dividing between Brazil, Bolivia, or Colombia, but they, were, they wanted to organize the massacre of indigenous people and the extraction of rubber. Uh, the way that national states are dealing with the Amazon and other forests and, and corporations are very complicated. So, and in Brazil, it's hard to say that Brazilians care about the Amazon. Probably the one of the worst challenges that the Brazilian Amazon faces is from Brazilians from outside of the Amazon. I'm talking about internal colonialism. So the problem of the Amazon is pretty much in Sao Paulo. We see a gold mine, the financing of illegal gold mining in the Amazon are based in Sao Paulo. Uh, so it means to take responsibilities on that and to to just to, to face those those enemies of the Amazon in different places where they are uh, and produce new ideas, as Marcelo was saying, about to engage society. Uh, Viveiros de Castro, he has a beautiful idea that the Amazon may not be the lung of the world, but more the heart of the world. So the Amazon is like teaching us to, lead, to love the forest, to love the planet. And we need to, to realize that this is much more than only uh, consumer uh, engagement that we can have, but more, much more of, of a citizenship, of a global citizenship, and respecting those voices, learning with the experiences from indigenous people in the Amazon, outside of the Amazon, probably seeing more the connection between other biomas, such as the Cerrado and, 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 and the Amazon, and responsibility that we have everywhere where we are and to whom we vote. Uh, just some reflections that I think this is really important, Charlie, and, and it, it puts us in the place, I'm from South Brazil and I'm white, and I'm worried about the Amazon, and I want to, to, to act and, and to reflect upon that, just to, to mention that. Okay, so um, I am going to combine um, two questions, questions for Cassie Katia, but before I do that, I want to ask uh, Marcelo, and if you can answer this um, quickly, um, we have a lot of um, students, a lot of young people here listening to us, and you talked a lot about, uh, you know, um, changing the mindset, you talked about several transformations. So. What is your message for um, everyone? Doesn't have to be just young people, but we are we are in a university setting, right? So, what can universities and what can um, you know the future leaders of the world can do to change this mindset? It's an easy question, Marcel. You can answer that in thirty seconds. In addition to be easy, I think that. Um, Kasika Kacha already responded it in her initial um, in her initial remarks, but I think that the role of uh, academia is no longer, in my opinion, find new problems, but solve the problems we currently have. I think the role of academia is to help us make the Amazon that we imagine in the future become reality. And for that, I think the first thing we need is a strong solidarity, as Felipe was saying, from academia towards keeping in not only that uh, region, the Amazon, but I would say keeping all uh, intrinsic valuable uh, biomes in the planet as a standing planet. 
because we need them uh, not only for our planet, but also for our own survival. So if we were to take a very selfish approach here and talk about us as, as human beings and therefore students and youth looking into their future, um, that is a very important and needed thing. So look into whatever field of study you are and think about those transformations that we spoke, those four transformations, energy, food, materials, and um, our mindset and see how you can contribute to that. And the second thing I would say is work with the people and the communities from the places you want to support. Listen to them and include them in your decision-making process. Okay, music to my ears. I, I mean, I, I'm in public health and uh, we cannot do anything in public health if we don't go to the ground and we listen from the people facing the problems because nobody knows better what are the problems and the possible solutions um, than the people facing them. Um, and I, I think it was um, um, you mentioned, but I think uh, Felipe also mentioned that but people just don't know about the Amazon. And, and uh, it's a shame that a lot of Brazilians have no idea what is the Amazon. And if we don't change that, this, this changing mindset um, will be hard. So we lost Kastika Katya, unfortunately. So I'm gonna ask um, one of the questions and then um, one of you can take it. So it, it, it's a long question from uh, Robert Davenport, but it's the whole idea of the role of the of the settlers, the, the migrants that settle in the Amazon and in, in many different colonization projects. And, and the whole idea is um, what about their role in, in also doing, um, you know, um, development, bioeconomy, um, social reforestation. So how do you uh, bring together uh, both the, the, the knowledge from the indigenous people, but also from those migrants that came into the area? So who wants to answer that one? Uh, I, I can start because I think the issue here that his question is about decolonization and decolonization of, of knowledge. This, uh, the migrants who went there to colonize, to exploit, and remain thinking on that, remains uh, until today having uh, this idea of just being in the Amazon now, and then maybe a few years later, they can move to another agrarian frontier. It, it, it's hard. I don't think they're going to learn with indigenous people. And uh, I'm more interested in understanding why are they thinking like that and how can it challenge uh, the colonial mindset? And in this sense, um, the universities play an important role. And I would highlight the importance of public universities in Brazil which are in, uh, uh, in a dangerous threat from the government, but because they started a process, some universities, uh, uh, an intense process of decolonization of knowledge. This past week, the Federal University of Minas Gerais recognized the knowledge of uh, some wonderful uh, uh, peasants, uh, leaders in, in, in Brazil, such as Joelson from Teia dos Povos, the net of people in Bahia, which maybe in the sense, as Robert is saying, is trying to uh, build dialogues among the experience of, from indigenous people and peasants. I mean, there's a lot of uh, alternatives and anti-colonialist movements happening in Brazil in terms of producing knowledge, experience, idea, and alternatives to other economy. The problem is that they have been systematically silenced uh, the example that I gave about the Claudia and Maria and the love that they developed on the forest and it, today called Elise is, is still doing that and it's just, uh, she's a friend of Katya. I mean, they are exchanging and they are fighting together. The question is, is we feel that we are far. I'm not feeling far from the Amazon here and, and we have the chance to, to be with them today. It's, but how can we connect in terms of strategies and ideas? and practice. This is, this is a challenge and universities play an important role in there. Okay, um, thanks so much, Felipe. So, um, so 
um, Katya is back. Um, so, Kasika Katya, um, so we, I would like to ask one question that came here um, from people watching us. And um, what Filippi was discussing was the role of the migrants um, um, that settle in colonization projects and also play a role in, in, in the production and uh, reforestation and so on. But the other thing is, what is your, um, what is your perspective on the um, the agro negocio, um, so the agro business, um, and in in a way threatening both indigenous areas and quilombolas um, in the Amazon. So, if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how indigenous groups interact with the migrants that settle in the Amazon, but your take on the agro business um, in indigenous areas in quilombolas. Então, é, faltou energia aqui, aí né, eu saí daí, não, não ouvi tudo de, de vocês falando. Mas, assim, a gente tem o nosso pensamento do agronegócio, né? Porque tanto é que está bem pertinho de nós aqui em Rondon. E a gente é contra o plantio de eucalipto e de soja, porque ele seca os nossos igarapés, ele rouba nossas, né, nossos rios. E a gente vem, tem essa disputa né, também com os fazendeiros que estão tá ao nosso redor e que envenenam, né, jogam os venenos para o rio. E o eucalipto é a Suzano, né, que passa com a celulose, que tem um plantio aqui perto, em Goianés, e outro bem aqui perto de nós, São Pedro. E a gente vê que nós estamos já cercados com o agronegócio. E o agronegócio, para nós, ele não interessa, assim né, na forma... É do jeito que eles estão fazendo. A gente tem o nosso pensamento, a nossa estratégia, tem vontade de ser é, pequenos empreendedores com os produtos que nós temos, valorizar o que já temos, que nem o açaí, a castanha. Hoje eu trabalho com a castanha, eu beneficio a castanha. Por que, que eu beneficio a castanha? Porque, assim, é, a castanha, ela, todo ano, os de fora, eles roubam a castanha nossa, né? comercializa E quando o meu povo tira a castanha, eles compram pelo um preço lá embaixo, pelo um preço, né? Como é que está comprando banana? E hoje nós temos a castanha como ouro preto e o açaí também. E aí, o que é que eu fiz? Eu montei uma pequena fábrica e eu compro é, a castanha pelo um preço maior do meu povo, eu beneficio, beneficio a castanha e vendo ela né, pelo preço mais, né, em compensação, um preço mais razoável para a minha comunidade e ela serve como projeto sustentável, assim como o açaí, assim como a mandioca, serve para alimentação, para me fazer ração para o meu peixe, que hoje eu crio peixe, porque... Eu creio que nosso rio também está contaminado né? pela própria é, combustível, pelo próprio é, tipo de, de, da ferrovia que desce para os nossos igarapés. Né? A gente percebe que houve uma mudança no nosso igarapé, o nosso igarapé secou. Então, assim, eu vejo o agronegócio, ele está é, nos sufocando. É, tá? A nossa terra está... É, não vai crescer a nossa terra, mas o projeto que está vindo está nos focando. É muita é, cidade ao redor, aonde vem a bebida, aonde vem é, a prostituição, que a gente tem medo de chegar até nós. A gente vê em outros povos o que está acontecendo. É, droga, né? tudo isso. A gente se preocupa com o agronegócio, de ele chegar dessa maneira e nós não tá preparado, é, preparado dá tempo de preparar o nosso jovem né o número de bebida que a gente sabe que é uma influência muito grande e a gente está muito próximo da cidade então esse agronegócio essa PEC né que a PL 490 é para nós ela não tem muito interesse para nós porque nós não pensa é, de desmatar o nosso território mas nós pensa de trabalhar é, nas, nas mata é como é que diz chamado de capoeira é um cuidado que nós tem com a nossa natureza nós não pensa e tanto é que hoje nós nós segura a nossa floresta hoje 
se vocês puxar no satélite, vocês vão ver que a nossa é, mata ela está intacta, né? Aonde tem o maior desmatamento é quando chega o tempo de política, que os políticos é, a, a compra voto oferecendo a própria madeira que nós temos no território. Então são são várias enfrentamentos de roubo de castanha, de caça, de é, de eles tirar madeira porque nós não temos ainda precisão e nunca passou pela nossa cabeça de nós explorar o nosso território. Tanto é que nós somos contra essa ideia né, de, de, de exploração de garimpo, de madeira. Eu creio assim que se todo indígena parar para pensar, é, não tem como é, eles querer desmatar, acabar com a mata. Eu vi o um dia passando no Fantástico. É muito triste o ponto que chegou, né? Mas tudo isso envolve o capital, o costume, onde acostuma o indígena mal acostumado, é, como eu falo, com dinheiro. né? Eu creio que o indígena ele tem que se cair em conta, proteger seu território. O que é que ele vai deixar para o futuro, para os filhos dele? Então, isso é uma preocupação muito grande. E hoje eu vejo que o agronegócio não é interesse do indígena, mas nós temos interesse de reflorestar e plantar algo que dá retorno para a nossa comunidade e valorizar o que já temos. Nós temos muitos produtos importante aqui no nosso território. Então, é isso, a minha visão. E o que eu tento passar para o povo também, né? que nós não venha chegar a essa, esse ponto. Muito obrigada. É, I'm going to finish in Portuguese. So, um, eu, eu queria agradecer Marcelo, Felipe, Cacica, Kátia, por compartilhar histórias, experiências de vida é, conosco nessa tarde. É, eu tenho certeza que muita gente que está nos ouvindo vai ter um olhar diferente para essas questões. É, Cacica, Kátia, a senhora trouxe uma inspiração enorme da importância da cultura, a importância da educação. É, e eu me lembro que é, durante essa pandemia, há, alguns meses atrás, eu participei de um evento em que a gente discutia exatamente como a gente pode mudar a vida de comunidades, não precisa de tanto recurso assim, diminuir desigualdades, e eu fiquei pensando, tem gente que está querendo pagar 55 milhões de dólares para ir para o espaço e passar não sei quantos, sei lá, quantos minutos, e a gente precisa de muito menos isso para diminuir desigualdades no mundo, né? Então, o mundo precisa de empatia, o mundo precisa de solidariedade, o mundo precisa se lembrar que ninguém é nada sozinho no mundo e que a, a gente precisa ajudar um ao outro, e no nosso caso, muito pessoal, é todo mundo é brasileiro aqui, pelo menos os que estão na tela, é, se a gente não tiver a Amazônia, tem muita coisa no mundo que vai por água abaixo se a gente perder. Então, eu agradeço a inspiração de vocês por ter compartilhado quase uma hora e meia é, o dia agitado para todo mundo, e eu espero que a gente possa continuar essa conversa, eu espero que eu possa lhe conhecer pessoalmente um dia, Cacica, Kátia, e eu acho que a gente tem que continuar essas conversas, inspirando a futura geração, para que quando a gente chegar ano que vem, as pessoas puderem ter essa consciência, esse compromisso para a gente mudar as coisas no melhor instrumento que a gente tem de mudança, que é o voto. Então, muito obrigada, gente. Eu espero é, ter contato com vocês em um outro momento. Thank you all that joined us this afternoon. And please join us in future Dr. Class events. Boa tarde. Tchau, prazer. Muito obrigado, Márcia, Thiago, todo mundo. Cacica, muita admiração. Obrigado. Boa tarde. E tchau, Márcia. Obrigado pelo Ioda. Foi uma grande inspiração também. <risos> Minha obrigado, inspiração pessoal. sempre. Obrigado, Fechou, pessoal. Tchau. Já vou fechar aqui. Valeu, tá. hein? Então tá. Tchau. Obrigado, Kátia. <risos>